Hello, welcome along to the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Welcome back. My name's Dan. This is the show where we inspect some of the most jaw-dropping secrets lurking all around the universe. We'll travel all around the galaxy, a few more as well, and we'll get you back in about half an hour's time, if that's all right. This week, we'll look at one of the most dangerous foods in the world. Also, why scientists think they're closer to making endless clean energy. And we've got your questions as always. This week they're on spots, elephants and mosquitoes. That's coming up after we head to the smartest school outside of the solar system. This is Deep Space High. Deep Space High. Space for all. Hi Quark, are you ready for the match later? Find your boots in the end? (laughs) That must be a relief. Bit hard to shoot a goal in the Galactic Junior League final when you're missing four of your six football boots. (laughs) I wish I was good at stuff like you. I just know I'm going to end up back on Earth when I'm older working in a boring job. Whilst you're holding the Galaxy Cup, I can just see it now. (laughs) Come on Sam, everyone's good at something and there's a place in space for all. Who'd like to show Sam how their interests at school can lead to a job in space? Well, you'll think I'm nuts, but I like math. (laughs) Yep, you're nuts all right, Aurora. Maths is complicated equations and difficult sums. Seriously, who does maths for fun? Why don't you tell us, Aurora, what it is about maths that you enjoy? It's solving puzzles, isn't it? Like that test we had last week where we had to work out how many gargantua gigaberries you could fit into a black hole. It doesn't feel like work at all. It's like a game. Football's a game. Maths is literally nothing like a game. I said you were nuts. That's enough, Sam. Aurora, you're right. Maths is all about puzzles and patterns. Puzzle solvers are of vital importance in space, even before things have got off the ground. Computer sim, Kennedy Space Center in Florida, please. Oh, cool. That's the SpaceX Dragon. Looks like they're... Loading it for a journey to the space station, right? That's right. It's an unmanned spacecraft that, like its Russian counterparts, carries supplies to the station. Mathematicians have to work out how much fuel is needed for the flight, as well as the exact quantities of supplies that are needed to keep the crew going until the next spacecraft arrives. Things like food and clothes, as well as soap and water. Sounds like my mum before we go camping. She works out what we need, right down to the last sheet of toilet roll. (laughs) Mathematicians are also behind planning of the route for each flight. Three, two, one, we have lift off. They will have worked hard to plan the exact route to reach the destination, as it's not just a case of going from A to B. You might need a helpful gravitational slingshot around the moon to adjust speed and direction. And maths can help us understand the universe itself. Computer sim, Jodrell Bank Observatory, please, which is near Macclesfield in the north of England, for those who don't know. Hey, that's near where I come from. They're like gigantic space telescopes. So cool. These giant telescopes receive data and images from the farthest parts of the observable universe. With the help of mathematicians, we can unravel the information and work out what distant planets and stars are like. How hot or cold they are, what the atmosphere is made of. Sounds like magic. Unlocking secrets, breaking the codes. All thanks to mathematical models that power other types of science, such as physics. By understanding the rules and patterns, we can better understand our place in the galaxy and beyond. Sounds great, I guess, but... Not for me. Not a fan of puzzles then, Sam. The only thing puzzling me is how Quark managed to lose four boots. One boot, fair enough. But four, that takes up a lot of space. (laughs) Never mind, Sam. There's an almost infinite number of jobs in space, and I'm sure we will find one for you. Well, if Quark can lose his football boots, I suppose anything is possible. (laughs) Except you lot leaving the room quietly. Class dismissed. Deep Space High. Space for all. With support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space.
Let's get to your questions then. If there's something sciencey that you want to know that's rattling around your brain that you've been thinking about through the holidays, uh, send it to me over on Apple Podcasts. Find the Fun Kids Science Weekly there. There's a little comment box at the bottom. That's where you leave it. This week, uh, this is from Lucy, who says, Why do we get spots? Now, your body is covered in pores, and they are tiny things that make hairs. Now, when these pores, little holes on your skin, when they become clogged with dirt uh, or dead skin skin cells or oil that your body makes, uh, they get a little bit infected, really. The dirt fills that tiny hole. They bulge up, and that's why you get a spot. Because you've got a little bit of grime in your pores, in your hair follicles, Lucy. Thanks for the question. This one is from Edward, who's in Somerset, who says, Why do elephants have tusks? Well, the tusks, elephant, are, 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 they're just massive teeth. You know the teeth that you've got that look a bit like fangs? On the top of your mouth, they're kind of either side of your middle few. Uh, they're your incisors. And ele- an elephant's tusk is a big incisor. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. They've evolved to have those because it helps them out in the wild. They use them to dig holes with, to break down trees with, and even sometimes to fight with. Thanks for the question, Edward. Uh, Lastly, today, this week, it's from uh, the Ashley Twins, who are in Los Angeles. Look, take me to Hollywood. Look, this show, it needs to be a movie. Thanks for getting in touch from LA, Uh, Ashley Twins. You want to know... Why do mosquito bites leave a bump on your skin and why do they itch? Do you want to hear something gross? This isn't very fancy like Hollywood. It's all because of mosquito spit. When a a mosquito bites into your skin, it leaves a little bit of saliva, a little bit of drool in there and your body gets to work because your body and your immune system is very good at recognising intruders and mosquito spit. I mean, it's exactly that. So it gets busy, it tries to flush it out and fight anything that might try and infect you. It sends more blood to the area where you've been bitten, that helps you get rid of the intruder. And that swells up, when you get a little bit of blood in one place, it swells up, it gives you a bump. And one of the things that happens when you swell a bit is that you itch. So that's why. And it's why you shouldn't scratch it too much as well, because you might burst uh, the skin and let that blood a little bit out. Uh, thank you so much for the questions. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on the show next week, let me know. Leave it as a review on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly big thing this year. This year marks 200 years since a very special invention. Uh, we wouldn't have electric power, mass communication, cars on the roads, computers in your house, phones in your pocket without this. The electric motor is two centuries old. It was invented by Michael Faraday at the Royal Institute and Charlotte New is from the Royal Institute and she's here to tell us more. Hey Charlotte. Hi. Now uh, the electric motor, a big thing made by Faraday. Who was Michael Faraday and, and I guess why was he so important? So, Michael Faraday is a very interesting man. Um, He was born in 1791 and he lived until uh, 1867. But he's an interesting man because he comes from a very humble background. He left school when he was 13 and he became a bookbinder's apprentice. And that's a long apprenticeship. It took him seven years to qualify as a proper bookbinder. But he had a passion for learning. And so, while he was but binding the books that were under his care, he would read them. Um, And he developed a great passion for science and he wanted to learn more. So he used to attend evening lectures and afternoon lectures wherever he could afford to pay the entry fee. And luckily for the RI, he was given tickets to attend Humphrey Davies four lectures that took place at the Royal Institution in 1812. He came along and he took notes, much like you would do in school of your science experiments. So he took notes of all the experiments that Davy did within his lectures and he wrote them up and bound them in a book. Obviously, that was his profession, his trade. So he knew how to do that. And he produced this very neat, lovely little book. And he presented it to Davy a couple of months after the lectures and asked for a job. 
and through various um, different circumstances, he was given a job at the RI uh, within a few months and he became a laboratory assistant at the RI. And then from there, he uh, he never left, really. Um, and he undertook all these amazing experiments um, and discoveries at the RI through his passion for science. So he, he discovered uh, benzene. He made the first induction ring, the first generator it's it's a really it's the first time anyone got a spark from a magnet so he produced an electrical spark from a magnet um which is a fundamental thing that you know that is amazing discovery but he also did numerous other works for uh trinity house so for the admiralty he helped to see if uh, they could electrify lighthouses, and obviously at the time in the in the eighteen hundreds, lighthouses were incredibly important. Our shipping uh, industry was as vital. We're an island, so you needed to have working lighthouses. Um, but he also is obviously famous for the RI for all the work that he did in science communication. Um, he was a big proponent for learning and for continual learning but also for learning for children so he developed the Christmas lectures which started in 1825 and have been going every year since apart from the the years of the second world war where they felt it was too dangerous to have lots of children in a building which is very understandable he just loved to teach and to educate people on dis- science scientific discoveries so he's he's there he's been busy tinkering away making this and that, making stuff at lighthouses. And then we come to the electric motor. How did he kind of stumble upon that invention? So actually, the electric motor is one of the first things that uh, he helped develop. Um, He'd been working at the RI uh, for about 10 years um, when he was tasked with writing up a history of work on electricity and magnetism, everything that had happened up to that point. And in 1820, there was a gentleman called Hans Christian Orsted who worked in Copenhagen University. And he was professor of physics there. And he'd kind of devised this experiment purely, I think partly by accident, where he had a copper wire attached to a battery And he leant across a compass needle and he'd seen that the compass needle had turned. And, you know, this was a very significant experiment for the time um, that it was the first time that it really showed that there was a relationship between an electrical current and uh, magnetism. So during the course of Faraday's uh, research into writing up this history of electromagnetism, um, he recreated Orsis' experiment and then he decided to further investigate. So on the 3rd of December, 1821, so nearly a month uh, month to the day, shall we say, uh, 200 years ago, he got a glass vessel, which he placed a bar magnet in the base of, and he uh, set it on a wooden uh, a piece of wood. Uh, he attached the base of the piece of wood to uh, a battery. And then he also hung um, a piece of copper wire inside the glass vessel, which was also attached to the wooden base. And then he half filled the glass vessel with mercury. And with the battery attached, um, there was a force created around the copper wire um, and then there's obviously a force around the magnet and the two interacting uh, caused the copper wire to turn. Um, it, this was helped obviously with the use of the mercury. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature and it's a very good conductor of electricity. But this this kind of experiment was the first time that you got mechanical movement from electricity. So it was a really big kind of wow, eye-opening moment uh, in in scientific discovery. And it's gone on to influence so much. I mean, the electric motor, we ran through them earlier, mass communication, motorised travel, the computers at home, the phones in our pockets. So much is going on. This all happened at the Royal Institution. I think I said institute earlier. I meant institution. Uh, and you, you've got a lot going on this year uh, to to celebrate Faraday's invention. Just tell us a little bit more about that. 
Yeah, so we've got a number of things planned in in terms of talks and exhibitions within the building because we still have Faraday's first bit of equipment. So we still have the first motor that he made. We still have his scientific notebook. So he always wrote down his experiments um, so that he could learn from them and he could reference them in later experiments. Um, So we will will be having those on display that people can come and see. Um, But it's just, it's really... Much like Faraday's experiment, it wasn't the end of his investigation into electromagnetism. It was the start of it, really. So we're counting September this year as as the start of our kind of uh, celebration of Faraday's work because he went on to do much, much more, as as, um, we've kind of described before. So it's a wonderful way of highlighting that, you know, there's this tiny little thing that, actually is so important as you said in our lives today it's 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 a component of many of our ways of travel it's you know there's many electric motors up on the international space station um but it's just it's that message of always kind of investigating and that that faraday always had this passion for furthering uh his investigations that we we were kind of really hoping to do through our lectures and um our exhibition to highlight the work that faraday did amazing that's what happening from september you can find out more rigb.org is where you need to go uh, charlotte new thank you so much for coming on and telling us all about it thank you it's been a pleasure For this week's Dangerous Dan, we're looking at one of the most deadly cheeses on the menu. It's an Italian cheese. It's called Casumazu. It's a big crumbling wheel of the stuff. It looks ideal, tasty, maybe a little bit stinky, but you could have it on a sandwich or a cracker. Well, you might want to until you hear what's in it. You could call Casumazu maggot cheese. Maggot cheese. I'll say it again. Maggot cheese. Cheese. Cheese made with maggots. This is how you make it. You heat up the milk and then you let it sit for about three weeks so it can curdle. Then you cut the top crust off so flies get into it. Then these flies, they lay their eggs inside the cheese. You leave that wheel of cheese in the dark for months. You don't touch it. Then the fly eggs, they hatch into maggots who begin eating the cheese. And it gets even more disgusting, I warn you. Because what happens when you eat? Mm, the, 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 the maggots, they, they poo the stuff out too. And that's the most important part. Apparently, that, what, that maggot poo is what gives the cheese, this kasumazu, its rich flavour. The problem is, and people eat it. People pay a lot of money for it. If you eat it too early, though... If the maggots are still alive when you swallow them, they can live, they can grow inside your body and rip holes in your intestines, which makes this cheese one of the most deadly in the world. But still, even with that risk, Kasumazu, uh, the maggot cheese, is one of the most rare, expensive and sought-after cheeses in the world. We're travelling back through time now to see some deadly beasts from the past. This is Age of the Dinosaurs. Age of the Dinosaur with Dinosaur Action Magazine, the number one mag for dino fans. Imagine going back in time, not 100 years or 1,000 years, but millions of years. to the age of the dinosaur. Welcome to the end of the Cretaceous period, around 65 million years ago. Around this time, there were more dinosaurs than ever before. The world was crowded with groups of Triceratops, duck-billed Edmontosaurus, squawking birds, and a wide variety of plant and sea life. The end of the Cretaceous period is also where you'd find one of the best-known dinosaurs of them all, Tyrannosaurus rex. He's coming this way. Quick, run! You definitely want to run from a T-Rex. His name means King of the Tyrant Reptiles. And he was a terrifying meat-eating dinosaur found in the continent that is now North America. This carnivore was massive at over 12 metres long and 6 to 7 tonnes in weight. 
He gouged at prey with his enormous jaws and his curved teeth made it hard to escape. Despite standing as tall as an elephant, T-Rex's brain wasn't much bigger than a loaf of bread. However, a cast from a fossilized T-Rex skull shows the parts in charge of his sense of smell were bigger than in other reptiles. Ugh, what's that horrible smell? That's the smell of rotting meat. A T-Rex could sniff out a carcass from over a kilometer away. It might not have been as tasty as fresh meat, but it was an easy meal. Quick, another T-Rex is coming. That's not a T-Rex, but it's still good to hide. That's a Tabasaurus batar, or t batar. Tabasaurus came from Asia, not North America, but had a lot in common with T-Rex. They looked similar and were both top predators. Scientists think they're closely related even though they lived on the other sides of the world. Some have even suggested that they might be the same species, but there were differences. Lab tests show that Tabasaurus had a less flexible jaw, so he might have preferred carcasses to hunting wriggling prey. And whilst T-Rex had eyes that faced forward, Tabasaurus had more sideways facing eyes. Oh no, I think he's looking at me. I think he's more interested in that herd of hadrosaurs over there. When hunting, he'd prefer to pick off the old, young or sick members of a herd. But let's not hang about. Paleontology, pick. The age of the dinosaurs came to an end 65 million years ago. It is thought that a giant asteroid six miles across smashed into the Earth, where the town of Chicxulub in Mexico now sits, triggering tsunamis and dust clouds that blotted out the sun. Plants could not grow. Animals were cold and hungry and began to die. From the seas to the skies, many creatures and plants disappeared forever. In fact, seven out of every 10 species perished. The age of the dinosaurs had gone and with it 200 million years of the most amazing creatures the world has ever seen. Thanks to paleontologists, we know much about what it was like, but there are many mysteries that remain. Maybe one day, you will make a new discovery yourself. Age of the Dinosaur with Dinosaur Action Magazine, the number one mag for dino fans. Let's get to this week's Science in the News. Scientists say that July was the hottest month ever in America. The records for the hottest years, they've all come in the last three years, and they say that this is a hugely worrying sign in the fight against climate change. Also, astronomers have captured some of the best pictures of galaxies in deep space that have ever been taken. They're in a much higher definition than ever before because technology is so advanced now and it shows the inner workings of these galaxies. The scientists hope that it will show more about how black holes make stars. And finally, scientists in America say they've almost reached a long goal in nuclear fusion research. Now, nuclear fusion is what powers the sun, what heats us up. Chemicals reacting together under huge pressure which make energy. The National Ignition Facility over in America it uses a powerful laser to heat and compress hydrogen fuel which starts the fusion which makes the energy and they hope it might make an endless clean energy source. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. We've still got some tickets left for our very first live show uh, on Friday, Friday the 27th, wherever you're listening to this, unless you're a proper scientist and you can actually travel back through time. If it's after the 27th, don't worry about it. If it's before, if you're near London, 
Uh, come on down. We'd love to see you there. We'll have high fives. We'll have selfies. We'll uncover some of the secrets of the universe together in the very first Fun Kids Science Weekly live show. Now, if you've enjoyed this podcast, we've got loads more for you over on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your shows. They're on funkidslive.com and on the free Fun Kids app. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can listen to us all over the country on your DAB digital radio, on that free Fun Kids app, and at funkidslive.com. 